where my grandparents uh, purchased back in 1952, where they raised my dad and my uncles and my aunt, where my parents bought the home in 1975 when my mom was pregnant with me. And so I grew up here with my siblings, and it's a lot of rich history for the McDuffie family. But it's also the home uh, where there was a racially restrictive covenant. I actually located it. I was doing some research a few years ago and went online and located that racially restricted covenant uh, that was put in place by uh, the prior owners uh, in this community. And it essentially said that uh, the house shouldn't be sold or owned by, by anyone uh, who's black. And it wasn't until the 1948 Supreme Court case uh, of Shelley B. Kramer and the companion case of Herbie Hodge, which actually is a home in 216 Ryan Street in Bloomingdale, was one of the companion cases that went before the Supreme Court, uh, where Charles Hammond of Houston was the lawyer uh, in that case, where the Supreme Court said that uh, the federal government cannot enforce racial restrictive covenants, and that that would violate the Constitution of the United States. And four years later, uh, my grandparents bought into the neighborhood, this house right here. Uh, and so, you know, it's really an honor and a privilege to, to still have it in the family. Uh, it's a community where growing up, there were lots of families like ours. Working class, large families, four, six, eight people to a family. Uh, and it was a really, really close-knit community where everybody knew one another, uh, where there were generations, frankly, that lived in the same house uh, in homes that have been passed down, similar to the way that this had been passed down to my family. So and to be the third generation of McDuffies living here with my wife, Princess, and my two daughters, Casey and Josie, uh, it, it's really a, a privilege and an honor, uh, even though the neighborhood has changed a lot from when I was growing up. And I know it changed uh, drastically from the days uh, during the 50s when my dad uh, was growing up here with my grandparents. And they uh, really started the original name with Stronghold. Uh, so it dates all the way back to the 50s. And so it's a lot of history here. Still a beautiful neighborhood, uh, despite some of the change that's occurred around us. You know, most people don't know anything about the Stronghold neighborhood. Uh, it is not, uh, had not been an official neighborhood uh, until more recently. Uh, it's technically part of Edgewood, uh, but it is a small, close-knit neighborhood that uh, got its name back in the 50s and 60s uh, because of sports. And so there were a bunch of guys uh, and girls uh, who, people like Malcolm Taylor, uh, who's one of the originals, the Gates family, he brought these kids together to help to occupy their time. They started a football team, they had a uh, baseball team, basketball team, they had cheerleading teams. And the name that they came up with back in the 50s was Stronghold. And although it started just as the name of uh, the sports teams, after a while, uh, it just stuck. And it was a neighborhood name. Uh, and people who grew up during that uh, generation, uh, if you went to McKinley Tech during the uh, you know late 50s, early 60s, then you're likely to know uh, the neighborhood of Stronghold. Uh, it is not a prominent neighborhood in Ward 5 or across the District of Columbia, except that it's very prominent to the people who live here, who experience life uh, inside the uh, the alleys of Stronghold is how we often refer to it. Uh, it's made up of a bunch of different alleys and, you know, it's just people who largely were, you know, blue collar, working class, uh, people with large families who cared about each other deeply and cared enough about the community uh, to really stick together in every aspect of the word. And so I'm um, still proud to call it Stronghold. We're proud that you know it's recognized by the D.C. government uh, as the neighborhood of Stronghold these days. And, and folks who've moved into the neighborhood have also embraced it more recently as well. So we inside uh, the new uh, gym inside the Regional Rec Center, which did not exist before we made that investment of $20 million to build it. And so this is... Uh, I like to think this is like the centerpiece of this recreation center, uh, which, you know, pre-COVID got a lot of action, they had camps and everything 
uh, here. Actually, uh, my daughter came down to play ball a few times uh, inside here as well. Now, growing up, there was no indoor gym. So I had to travel across town uh, with my parents to drop me off at number 10 Boys and Girls Club at 14th and Clifton. And lots of fond memories there. Uh, we were a really good team. I played with people like Anwar McQueen, uh, Travis Allen, Michael Day, uh, Michael Craig, Danny and Ray Ray, who grew up on Hanover. We had a, we had a real, real tight squad uh, coached by uh, Ed Hill, a.k.a. Huckabuck, LeBarry Williams, a really disciplined team, and we won multiple championships in Boys and Girls Club. Uh, went all the way up, we played together from 10 and under when we were about eight or nine years old, uh, at least up to about uh, 14 and under Boys and Girls Club, 15 and under in AAU when we played with Kingdom Boys and Girls Club. And so uh, a lot of talent, uh, some of which went and played Division I uh, basketball. I wasn't one of those people. Uh, but, but we had a lot of time. People came through the doors of Kingman Boys and Girls Club, which is located over in, in, in Logan Circle, uh, with people like um, Pep. Pep, who played with Dunbar, uh, Earl Tyson, you had Sammy Briggs, you had uh, people like Dwayne Simpkins, Bond Jones, uh, you had folks like uh, Sammy Briggs, I think, did I always say Sammy Briggs? Mm -hmm. Um, we had, a, we had a, a lot of great players who came through. Even people like Joey Beard, who went on to play with Duke, uh, played with Kingman uh, Boys and Girls Club. We played in every league you can imagine. The Beltway League, we played in uh, PAL, the Police Athletic League. Um, it was just one of the things that I think kept me off of the streets where a lot of kids didn't have that same outlet. And so uh, I see this gym today as a magnet for young boys and girls, and some of the teenagers as well, uh, as an outlet for them, similar to how uh, number 10, King of Boys and Girls Club uh, were for me, and number 12, uh, football was for me as well. Number 12 operated out of Saratoga when I was growing up, and so uh, we had the community center on the grounds of today, Brooklyn Manor. Uh, but that was, that was one of the ways that we, we stayed in structured activities playing football out here. So uh, a lot of memories here, a lot of memories. As long as I can still have my game, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20. I like to think that the air is all over these balls. This is what I said. Like the rock. I want to shot. Walk out the door. Man, got it. That's the thing. Still got it. He's up here for a while. Yeah, that was a trick. I'm going to go with like, my generation of people, right? So I'm going to leave Kurt on the starting five. He's going to he run the point. Um, which is hard because I, I played against Mooch, okay. right? And, and I played against G. Jones, right? Guys that just, you know, could be fired. Ray would put up good points. Mooch just, you didn't want to stand in front of him when he do that left hand to cross you up. Um, but, but if you've never played, have seen Donald Ford play in his prime man for Dunn, like people forget about it because Mike went on to the league. You know, Mike went to the was like, Donald Ford, though, was a force to be reckoned with. He was one of those swing guys before it was popping, before, you know, you had people like, you know, uh, uh, Kevin Garnett, you know, before you had uh, folks who were in the league today that are versatile, you had Donald Ford who could put it on the floor, can, can hit a three, you know what I mean, go down low, post you up, and hit a short turnaround jumper, and dump it in the face. So Donald Ford would be in my, stop, in my top five. Uh, I would also put, I'm going to put, who am I going to put on two? Somebody can just shoot lights out. You know, it's going to be a lot of people that want to dumb by who might not like this. I'm going to tell you about one of the prettiest jump shots, though, right? Claude Green had that left hand man that was just, he would sit back there. And he had so many people on the team that were that, that could put up points, like Nate Langley, you know what I mean? And Pep and other folks. And uh, But he would sit back there and, and just and just kill you with that left hand three-pointer. Uh, but, I, you know, I would actually put Greg. I put Greg up, too. Okay. I put G at two. I put G at two. G, G, G could do what he wants. I mean, I watched him play against Curl one year. Uh, this had to be 93. And he was just, this was up Curl, where he just, he put on a show um, uh, up there. So I put G on that. I would also add somebody who, who might not be a household name, who actually was Wilson. Dave Carson. Yeah. 
they came out of Southwest and he had, he was like a quiet assassin. He was one of those guys that, you know, before you know it, he had 25, right? He wasn't dunking the ball. He wasn't shooting a ton of threes. He was just getting done, yeah. right? I mean, one move into the hole, it was precision. It was like a blue collar worker out there that just grinding. And so they would have to be on the floor uh, on, on that top five. And I don't know who would be at the four. Who are we gonna put at the four? I can't go with two people from Dunbar, so I'm gonna leave Mike out. Um, let me see who we go with the four. I don't know, Big Gravy went to Condoza back in the day, man. It was undersized. He wasn't anything with about 6'6", six, six, but he had leaps up out the gym. Uh, Grady was a beast. I don't know if he'd be in the top five. I would put, uh, who else am I put in my generation in that top one? I'd probably go with like somebody like Stacey. Stacey Robinson. Man. Stacey Robinson was just me. Yeah, just me. And had game, man. And, and so I would put him in that top five, too. So I'm going to leave it there. Okay. Again, Kurt Smith, no disrespect. That's my top five. Holler me tomorrow, you might get a different top five. <laughs> <laughs>